Welcome back to our quality management system video. This is part one of the 12 quality essentials. The first of the quality essentials will be organization. Now the term organization used in the context of quality management indicates both the management and some of the supporting organizational structure. Now under management, there should be a commitment, commitment from the managers or the leaders. This means that they should fully support, and not only that, they should actively participate in all of the activities of QMS. With their support and participation being visibly seen by the members, this would show them and make them understand the importance of all the efforts. Now, the laboratory leaders, aside from being fully committed, should have certain qualities, and one of these qualities is vision. That means that they should have a clear goal. They know where they're going, they can see where they're going, so that they can relay these to all the members and all of them can work towards that same goal. They should also have a good team building and motivational skills and of course it's important that they are able to communicate properly with their members and aside from that a good characteristic of a leader is that they should be able to use the resources the available resources properly now uh, aside from all of the characteristics the different responsibilities of the leaders would be the following so they would be they are responsible for designing the QMS to make sure that they are implemented that they should maintain them and in the end to improve the overall quality management system inside the laboratory the structure of the organization should be clearly defined and we can do this with an organizational chart now the organizational chart should be functional that means it's useful and updated it should also be um, let's say accurate and another characteristic of an organizational chart is that it should be complete now that is very important if the organizational chart is clearly defined many of the problems can be prevented why because that means that the responsibilities of each of the members would be stated in the organizational chart and if all of them understand what their job is and if all of them know what each of them would have to do this would prevent any problems in the future and according to ISO let me give you the number. So it's ISO 15189. The laboratory should have a quality manager. So it is a requirement. Now the quality manager is the person who is responsible to make sure that the quality policies and the quality procedures are being carried out properly. Now in the organizational chart, the quality manager usually sits high in the chart why because he is given the responsibility and most importantly the authority to make sure that he can make everyone else follow their jobs and descriptions together with their roles and responsibilities for the qms now if your laboratory is big so if you have a large laboratory it might be efficient more efficient to have several quality managers maybe per section so a quality manager for the clinical chemistry section another one for the hematology section another one for cm and so on and so forth but if your laboratory is just small then usually the role of the quality manager is given to the senior medical technologist and here in the philippines that would be the chief medical technologist the second quality essential is personnel and this is the most important laboratory resource therefore the personnel should both be competent and motivated the success or failure of a laboratory will depend on the knowledge and the skills of the personnel and motivated employees are usually the ones that would have commitment in their work it is therefore important that we be able to recruit and to retain 
laboratory personnel that are competent. This is essential so that in the end, we have a quality laboratory. So what is competence? So when we say competency, this can be defined as having the knowledge, the skills, and the behavior. So all of these should be present. It's not enough to be knowledgeable about the steps. You should be able to perform it properly. So that would be your skills. And while doing it, there should be good behavior. So again, knowledge, skills, and behavior should be present for, for you to say that the personnel is competent. So the application of all of the knowledge, the skills, and the behavior is important. So how do we know if the employee is competent? This is where competency assessment comes in. So the goal of competency assessment is to be able to measure and of course to document the personnel competency. You have to identify the problems and if there are any problems, you should be able to correct these issues or problems before they affect patient care. So let's say that your personnel is not competent. Okay, what can we do? This is where training comes in. So training is the process to provide. Okay, this is where the management provides the knowledge, the skills, and the behavior for the personnel so that they can meet the requirement. What if your personnel are already competent. You were able to hire competent personnel. So all of your personnel are um, okay. What you do then is that you have to maintain their competency and that's where continuing education comes in. So continuing education is more of an educational program. This is where the, the employees are kept up to date in the particular area uh, for their knowledge and skills. So this is very important because in laboratory medicine, there's a lot of changes happening. There's, it's constantly changing. So there should be an effort coming from the employees and the management to make sure that everyone are kept up to date. Next would be that the employees should have a periodic formal appraisal. So appraisal is when you check the employees. What is the difference of the appraisal from the assessment? Well, the employee performance appraisal is broader than the uh, competency assessment that we have mentioned earlier. In the appraisal, we may look into, let's say, the efficiency of the personnel. Okay, we can also look if the personnel is following all the policies of the organization or of the laboratory. We can also check if they are observing safety rules, if they follow these safety rules. And of course, it's important since we're dealing with um, different people in the laboratory, we also have to check if they have good communication skills and if they can provide proper customer service for the patient. And another important thing is that to see if the employee is punctual. So this might be a problem for some, but if you work in the laboratory, you have to come in on time. If your duty starts at 7 a.m., then you have to be in the laboratory before 7, before 7 o'clock in the morning because you should be ready to work at 7 a.m. So you can't come in late always and that would affect your appraisal. What else? Well, since we've mentioned that it is broader than assessment, it also can include the technical competency of uh, the employee and of course the professional behavior. So the uh, appraisal looks at all of these, all of these um, items to see if the employee is competent. Next, 
The last one under personnel is that medical laboratories should maintain employee records. So what is in the employee records? They have information like, for example, the position that the laboratorian has or the dates that are important for the employee. These information may also be used to give benefits for the employee. Other things that may be included in the records would, let's say, be the terms and conditions of his employment. And of course, what's important with records is that they are kept in a uh, safe place or a secure site to be able to protect the confidentiality of the employee. And that is it for personnel. The third quality essential would be equipment. Now, a great deal of thought and planning should go into equipment management, and there are different elements that we can use to help us in this one. So the first one would be selection and purchasing. So in selection and purchasing new equipment, there should be certain criteria that we would follow. So we just don't buy whatever is out there. You have to see which one would fit the laboratory uh, clearly. And other questions would be when you find the right one that you want to get, do you purchase or do you just lease it from the company? And all of this would depend on the capability of the laboratory. The second element would be installation. So questions for the new equipment. So you've already bought the equipment. Now you have to ask what the requirements would be for the installation. What do you need? Because there are some machines that would need to be in a very cold room and the Philippines is a hot country. So sometimes you would need to set up a separate room for for the sole purpose for keeping that equipment maintained properly. So you have to see what other requirements is needed for installation. Another question is who will be installing uh, the new equipment? The next element would be calibration and performance evaluation. So the things would be what we need to calibrate and of course who will be validating these equipment if they are operating properly. You have to make sure that the equipment that you bought can be used up to its full potential, uh, full potential and that it would be working properly when you have it. Another element is maintenance. So in maintenance, there is usually a schedule that we would need to follow. And most likely than not, we follow the schedule that is recommended by the manufacturer. It's up to the laboratory if they think they, they need additional preventive maintenance. And of course, we have to see if the current maintenance for the machines is enough for the new equipment as well. Next element would be troubleshooting. So in troubleshooting, there should be a clear procedure to be uh, that we should follow. If ever the machine breaks down, you should know what to do. These are steps like you do this first. If it doesn't work, the next step is to do this and that until you get the machine working. Next, if it's really broken, then we should talk about the service and the repair. Uh, a factor would be, a factor under this one would be if the repair is available in that geographical area? Can the laboratory obtain the necessary service for the repair, especially if you're in the rural area? And for the service, a big question for that is the cost. How much would it cost to be able to repair the broken machine? Would it, would it, would it be enough to spend that much or should you just buy a new equipment? And lastly would be the retiring and disposing of the equipment. When should the equipment retire? So that is a good question to ask. Up to when should be using the equipment? And when you do decide that the equipment should not be used anymore, how do you dispose of it? Where does it go? Who does it go to? Where, uh, where does it stay? So those are uh, the different questions under equipment. 
The fourth quality essential is purchasing and inventory. A good quality laboratory will have an inventory maintenance and purchasing that would ensure that appropriate quantities of supplies and reagents are always available. There should be an uninterrupted availability of reagents, supplies, and services. If, for example, there is an inability to test or an unavailability of a service, even just for a short time, this can disrupt the clinical care for the patient. Now, it's not enough to have a lot of reagents and supplies. What you have should be high quality reagents as well. But that doesn't mean that you should break the bank you should also consider the cost. So the appropriate cost must be determined to have high quality reagents that the laboratory needs. Now, if there is careful management of inventory, this will help to prevent wastes. Wastage can occur if, for example, the reagents and the supplies are stored improperly if they are not stored according to manufacturer direction, or if the reagents become outdated, then all of those reagents and supplies would be considered as wastage because you will no longer be able to use them, even if you have already bought them. So it's important to continuously monitor the expiration dates of the reagents and the supplies that you have to make sure that what you have on hand are not expired. But uh, make sure that you do not overstock as well because overstocking or buying too much would only be costly and wasteful and inefficient for the laboratory as well. The fifth quality essential is process control, and it is divided into sample management and quality control. Let's start with sample management with the definition of sample versus the specimen. Now, a sample, as defined by ISO and CLSI, means that it is one or more parts taken from a system and intended to provide information on that system while the term specimen which is widely or very commonly used in the laboratory is used to indicate a sample that is taken from the human body so why are we differentiating this i just want you to know that since the reference for this video is the iso document it prefers the use of sample or primary sample uh, versus the specimen but it's okay if you are in a region or a place that uses the word specimen it's actually all right because the term specimen and sample can be interchangeably used anyway. I just want to, you to know that sample is the preferred term used in the ISO document. Okay, so what about the sample? So the saying is the quality of the work a laboratory produces is only as good as the quality of the samples it uses for testing. So that means the samples that we should be accepting in the laboratory should only be of quality. If you should reject a sample for any reason, then by all means, please reject it and just uh, collect or get another sample. Do not process samples that are not of quality because even if you accept the sample and then you process it, there's going to be errors somewhere, somehow along the way when you get to the result. Results of accepting uh, samples that are not quality would be a delay in the reporting of the test results because you might have to make unnecessary retesting because the re result that you have taken is wrong or there can be unnecessary recollection of the specimen and this can lead to a decreased customer satisfaction and of course if there's retesting and recollection that would also increase the cost for the laboratory. And what we want to avoid is, of course, giving incorrect diagnosis or treatment for the patient because this can lead to injury for the patient or even death. So you have to make sure that the samples that you process and accept in the laboratory are of quality and acceptable. So in the end, you have a accurate result. Now, even if the sample is of quality, you should always handle all samples as if they are infectious. Do not forget this. Always wear gloves, mask, your PPEs when receiving and processing samples. 
And in the laboratory handbook, the following in information should be uh, seen. So how the collection of a sample uh, should be done and the pre preservation that you need to do just in case that you can't uh, process immediately or there's a delay in the testing, how you should process the sample or specimen, where you should store and how you should store them, how do you keep these specimen if you need to keep them for future use, if not, how do you dispose them and how it is transported just in case that you need to transfer it to another site. Quality control, which is a part of the fifth quality essential, is used so that they can monitor the examination phase or the analytical phase of testing inside the laboratory. Now, the goal of QC or quality control is to be able to detect, to evaluate, and to correct the errors that may have been due to the test system. And these would be discussed in the next video, which is about quality control. Now, different quality control processes are applied so that we can monitor the quantitative, qualitative, and semi-quantitative tests. Again, quality control will be discussed further in the next videos regarding quality control. The sixth quality essential is information management, and this is closely related to the next or to the seventh quality essential, which is documents and records. An important element in information management are the unique identifiers. These are the patient identifiers and the sample identifiers. Patient identifiers are given to hospitalized patients, which are given a unique identifier upon admission. Now, depending on the policy or the rules of the hospital, sometimes patient identifiers are given to patients which are only used during the duration of their stay in the hospital, but others give patient identifiers assigned to them in a more permanent basis, which is used every time they are admitted or each time that the patient has any type of health care. Sample identifiers are used in the laboratory. So the laboratory assigns these unique identifiers to patient samples so they can be tracked throughout the laboratory. So patient identifiers is for the patient and the sample identifiers are for the samples of patients. Now the method for generating and assigning unique identifiers uh, within the information system may depend on many factors. Other laboratories use commercially available computer systems which generate their own uh, identifiers, but some laboratories using paper-based systems would need to establish their own. An example of a sample identifier is this number, which is 09051300047. And this would represent the 47th sample by the last number here, which was received on May 13, 2009. So that's the year, 0905 is the month, and 13 is the date. Again, every laboratory have their liber liberty to create their own unique laboratory or sample identifiers. Now, the information system may be entirely paper-based, or it may be computer-based. Or sometimes it can be a combination of both. For the manual or the laboratories using a paper system, uh, it's important that all employees know about data entry. The important thing to know about here is that all data entry should be complete because sometimes uh, an age might be missing, a birthday might be missing, uh, the gender might be missing. So all of the patient information should be entered. And it, it might it, it gets tedious if you write that every time uh, you need to do it. Another thing, uh, another problem that might be encountered in paper based is the legibility of the writing because illegible writing may be a problem and this should be addressed. Next would be the handwritten reports. All laboratory reports or handwritten reports given to the patient should be duplicated and these duplicates stays in the laboratory. 
what we have to note here is that the duplicate should be an exact copy of the report given to the patient so that uh, problems will not occur later on and that means that you have to make sure that errors in transcription do not happen. Last challenge for map paper-based would be the storage. When you store paper-based materials we have to keep in mind that the goal is that for you to be able to find a result when you need to find a result or you should be able to trace the sample throughout its pathway in the entire process of the laboratory so that if there's a problem we can find the problem and that we can uh, find what the source of the problem is. A computerized or electronic based information management system in the laboratory is called a laboratory information management system and it is referred to by the acronym of LIMS or LIS. And that ends this video, which is the part one of the 12 quality essentials. Make sure to watch part two, which will discuss seven to 12 of the essentials.